Hey everyone, I'm John with Roadkill Incorporated. If you've watched my videos, you'll know I'm a fan of Wedge computers. A Wedge is a computer that has the CPU and the keyboard all in one package, the most famous being the Commodore 64. But I've come to realize the 64 is only just the start of it, and there are hundreds of Wedges out there. For instance, in Europe, Amstrad was huge, and they made some really crazy ones. The CPC-464 came out in 1984, and is roughly in line with the Commodore 64 in terms of abilities. And as you can see, it has a tape drive built in, which was great at a certain moment in time, but it became kind of a dead appendage once the tape era passed. And then you have the Schneider version, which is exactly the same except for color scheme, and as far as I can tell, it was private labeled by Schneider for Germany. The Euro PC here is not really related, but it's an interesting wedge computer. It's a PCXT clone by Schneider. It came slightly later, and it has a 3.5 inch floppy drive. So I accumulated these, but quickly discovered they're somewhat of a challenge to use in the US because of the power and video situation. That's mostly because in Europe, they were typically powered by the monitor. So the monitor runs the show and has these two cables, one for video and one for power. And because Amstrad wasn't really sold in the US, you kind of have to import a monitor. So I did that and I got this one here and I tried it with the 464 and discovered it's dead. Then I tried it with the Schneider 464 and got a whole three minutes of use before the monitor's display reduced itself to a single line, which makes it kind of hard to read. But not long after, I found this. I mean, look at this perfect package. A guaranteed working 464 in great shape with monochrome monitor, command control joysticks, and a nice little transformer to deal with the European power situation, plus a GoTech device that allows you to load software from a USB drive, a perfect alternative to tape. I never imagined I'd get a GoTech for an Amstrad. Plus, the listing was in the US, you can't beat that. I paid $250 shipped, which is not super cheap, but for something guaranteed working, and if it solves my monitor situation, then hey, I'm doing it. So here it is, definitely well packed. In addition to bubble wrap, each item was wrapped in saran wrap, which doesn't really hurt, but I've never quite understood why people do this. Monitor double boxed, which is great. Very cool little modern transformer. I have a few, but I can always use another. Wiko command control joysticks, definitely my favorite joystick back in the day. And look at this GoTech, very involved, made by Zaxxon. Looks like one you probably buy as a kit rather than get pre-built. So I'm fortunate to run across it because I'm definitely too impatient to build something like this. Connect it all together. The monitor's cables are short and it turns out the connectors on the computer can be either on the right or the left, which makes positioning of the computer in front of the monitor awkward if you have the one it wasn't meant for. So anyway, plug the monitor into the transformer, then you power on the monitor, then the computer, and it works. Look at that. Let's hope the monitor doesn't explode after three minutes. I tried to tape and it just loaded forever and seemed to stall. I might be doing something wrong. I tried the Schneider out as well, and it also works great. Also interesting to note is the dead 464 has an English keyboard and the new one is Spanish. Here are the two monitors side by side, the dead color one on the left, it's a little bigger. It's easy to see why the color monitor was more expensive. There are other ways to use an Amstrad than having an Amstrad monitor. I found this guy here, which is a pretty rare vintage item actually. It has the two connectors on the computer side and it gives you an RF adapter so you can hook it up to an old CRT television. But get this, you can also use an Amstrad on a modern LCD screen. That involves a couple items, a custom SCART cable for the 464 and a SCART to HDMI converter. SCART is a really weird looking video connector that is super common in Europe, but completely unheard of in the US. The cable has the video DIN connector on one end, as well as the power for the computer, but it's a little odd. You have to find a generic five volt adapter. They're on eBay for like 10 bucks and you plug it into this end of the cable like that. You're sort of injecting power into the cable like an IV line. Then on the other end, plug SCART into the converter. Oh, and this crazy cable also has an audio out that you plug into the converter. 
Make sure to set it to PAL and have the other relevant video settings right. Not sure why I'm getting this static on the screen, maybe it's the screen. But anyway, between the SCART cable, power cable, and the converter, you'll be set back about $150. So it's an investment, but it's probably the most flexible solution. So let's get this GoTech going. Turns out it's called a DDI3 floppy emulator, and I got all the information I needed from this video by Novabug, so that was very useful. Thanks, Novabug. Preparing a USB thumb drive is a little tricky, as always with GoTex. Generally, the smaller USB stick, the better, and it should be in FAT32 format, I believe. Next, the way this works is you need to download a program that acts as a file manager for the game ROMs you're going to use. And here's the page for that. I'll put it in the notes. You download it and you put these files directly on the USB drive. So now that we've done that, let's take a look at the file manager. I'll install the GoTech, plug in the USB drive, power on the computer. This thing has some buttons. On the left side is reset. Then you have scroll left and right, then select. I don't know what this switch does. I guess it's not too important. But this one switches between AMS-DOS and Paradox. I think I'm pronouncing those correctly. These are disk operating systems. This device is essentially acting as a disk drive, and the computer needs a disk operating system to use a disk drive. AMSDOS is the Amstrad official disk OS, and Paradox is a third-party one. And, for example, if you select Paradox and Power On, you see reference to it here on the boot-up screen. If you type cat, then that gets you a directory of the USB, and you can see the file manager we loaded onto the flash drive, HXC. Now, it's important to realize you could have 100 ROMs on this USB drive, but you wouldn't see them here. You can only see them inside the file manager. We'll run the file manager by typing run quote hxc. And there's the directory of the USB drive, but as you can tell, there are no ROMs on it yet. So let's go get some ROMs. Just Google CPC 464 ROMs, which will get you to a site like this, and I'll download a few. So here's the thing. You'll notice that the ROMs tend to be in DSK format, but if you put DSK files on the drive, it won't work. They need to be in HFE format to work with this device. So long story short, you have to go to this page, I'll put it in the notes, and download a converter that converts DSK files to HFE, which is the format this thing needs. So I'll download the HXC floppy emulator, choose Mac, because I have a Mac, run the program, and then it lets you load in a DSK and then export an HFE. Okay, so now we've got a few HFEs. One thing to keep in mind at this point, these ROMs often have file names that for some reason are too long to be recognized. So to fix that, change the file names to just the name of the game. So now I'll drag the ROMs onto the USB and put the flash drive back into the Amstrad. And now we'll load up the file manager again. And yay, the ROMs are visible. Okay, so this concept gets a little tricky. The file manager has 15 slots. You can see them by pressing S. Think of them like records in a jukebox that are available. You might have 100 ROMs on the USB, but you have to put them in these slots to make them accessible by the interface on the device. Back to the directory, you can move up and down with the arrow keys, and you see in the upper right there is a slot number. Hitting enter drops the current selection into the slot number that is shown. If you hold down control, then the arrow keys change the slot number. So I'll put beachhead in slot one, then space taxi in slot two, then Rick Dangerous in slot three. Now when I hit S, you can see them there at the top of the list. Now I'll hit escape and save the config. Back at the prompt, now if you scroll left and right on the device, you can see the ROMs. There's the select button here, but it doesn't seem like you need to press it. Whichever ROM it's sitting on on the display is the disk that's mounted. For instance, I'll do a cat on Beachhead, and you can see that Beachhead is mounted there. So now I'll switch to Space Taxi, and it's there as well. Next, I'll run Space Taxi, and it boots. Look at that. In a nutshell, that's how to run a game off this device. I know it sounds horribly complicated, but once you get the concept, it's easy. And best of all, you now have access to literally thousands of great games just by searching for disk images and downloading them. And converting them, don't forget that. 
Anyway, I hope this was interesting and maybe you learned something. Obviously, I'm just scratching the surface here because I'm only starting out myself. But hey, if it helps a few people discover the world of Amstrad computers, it was all worthwhile. Thanks for watching.